You know the vibes. Welcome back to another week here at the Hoop Genius Podcast, brought to you by NBA 2K24. It's myself, Momutsi, alongside me as always, the three-time NBA champion, BJ Armstrong, and our weekly guest on a Monday, Mr. Scott Perry. All the way from the parking lot, to the boardrooms, <laughs> to the front office, and now he's here with us. How you doing, Scott? How you doing, BJ? Oh, man, I'm doing great, man. It's great to see you guys every week. Hmm. Uh, it's great to see you too. Now, I want to start by wishing you guys and any of our listeners who celebrate a happy Lunar New Year. Oh, It's the, it's the Lunar New Year. And to celebrate okay. that, our good friends at NBA 2K24 have released a My Team pack featuring okay. some superstar players who played in China and in the NBA. So you're going to be able to get your hands on Pink Diamond Yao Ming, who was the number one overall pick in 2002. He played at Shanghai Sharks before coming to the NBA, where he, when healthy, was an absolutely dominant force, is now a Hall of Famer. Um, you can also get uh, Stefan Marbury, a.k.a. Starbury, a legendary New York City point guard. Uh, he was an all-star in the NBA before a hugely successful in career in China, where he currently is the head coach of the Beijing Royal Fighters. You can also get, and I always pronounce his name wrong, so fellas, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Yi Yanlian. Is that the correct pronunciation? I have no idea. Well, he yeah. was the sixth was pick in the 2007 yeah. draft. He played for the Bucks, Nets, Wizards, and Mavs, Nets. and he had yes. so much success with the Chinese national team. And the fourth player you can get to celebrate Chinese New Year is Michael Beasley, an insanely talented baller, the second overall pick in 2008. And he's bounced back and forth between the NBA and China. Had huge, huge success in China. Hasn't quite ever found his fit in the NBA. But BJ and Scott, my question to you is, if you two are out of the park or if you two are playing pickup and you're running three on three, and those are the guys you can pick between, we're going to have a little draft. Who do you want on your team? Scott, because you're the guest, I'll give you the first pick. You've got Yao Ming, Stefan Marbury, Yi Yan Lian and Michael Beasley. Who are you running with? Oh boy. Um, you sit in the park. Yeah. Three on three in the park. No rules. Three on three in the park and we're in half court. You gotta give me the big fella. Yeah. You gotta give me the big fella. You gotta give me the big Yao. Yeah, I gotta take Yao number one. That makes sense. BJ, who are you taking? Because he's going, he's going, he, you're not going to be able to stop him. And, and the rest of the guys, who, who's going to guard you out there? And every rebound the ever. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when you when you said the part, I immediately shifted my way of thinking. <laughs> when exactly. you said the part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it just because it's a different game? Oh, I get game? it. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, I know. You, exactly. When you said the part, you know, if you said who I would have picked, that was different. But when you said in the park, mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. different rules in the park. Mm hmm. There's a different game in the park. Yeah. I'm going with I'm going with be easy, be he, easy. Oh, oh, <laughs> he, oh, he could get buckets now. Now, now if we got if, if, as far as a pickup game and a park game, mm -hmm. he may be the first one picked. I don't care who's out there. He he's, he's <laughs> one of the first. Guys. Be Walking easy, you put that hey. ball in the basket. Hey. Mm -hmm. You had him, Scott, didn't you? Didn't you I had, yeah, yeah we, I, we we had him in New York. I was just going to say that. And that's what made it tough. Why well, I hesitated a little bit in the beginning. But when he said three on three half court, that's why I shifted back to yeah. Oh, but, it, but if we were going up and down, I agree with you. Michael Beasley could score with the best of them. You can ask Kevin Durant that. You know, he and Kevin grew up together. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I mean, Michael Beasley was just... He was born to put the ball in the basket. Oh, and man, the big hands, left hand. Variety of ways, left, Crazy. right, jumpers, mid-range, you name it, he had it. Shout mm -hmm. out to V. Shout out to yes. Michael Beasley. He can Beasley. put oh, that no ball question. in the basket. Now, you can put it in the back, and he yeah. has the right mentality. Somewhere in his <laughs> DNA, he must have been from Detroit, or a family member <laughs> from Detroit. <laughs> 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 Don't try to claim everyone. Who you think you can pick? You got you and your star. And look, and you know, and again, if you're going up and down, and after after Beasley, you know, you talked about Steph. I recruited Steph when I was uh, assistant coach at the University of Michigan. Oh, so I've wow. been watching what? Steph since he was a young kid. You know, I was watching him since he was a sophomore in high school. And he was unguardable in high school. He was strong, beautiful first step, explosive. You know, he just was a natural at the position, a natural at the game. So uh, those are some good names, man. Yeah. Great names. Yeah, yeah there's mm -hmm. some great players. So if you guys are listening, yeah. haven't got a copy of NBA 2K yet, make sure you go get it. Do the link in the description and you can get those team in the Looney New Year My Team Pack. All of those will be um, great fun cards to play with in your team. Um, but this week, 
BJ and I have been talking a lot about the trade deadline. And obviously now we have Scott in the fold to use his general manager expertise. And um, the question that I have for you both this weekend, um, as we're recording this before the Super Bowl, just for everyone's awareness, who are the winners and losers of the NBA trade deadline? The teams that made the best moves, the teams that made the worst moves, the teams that should have made moves but didn't. Scott, we're going to go straight to you. Who were the big winners of this trade deadline? Well, I've got to go back to the L.A. Clippers, even though they didn't make the trade you know, at the deadline. They made it a couple months ago. And at the time of that trade, I probably wouldn't have thought I'd be saying this right now. But, man, kudos to those guys, starting with James Harden, how he's fit in, adjusted, uh, playing very good basketball. Kudos to Ty Lu for bringing it all together. Uh, Kawhi Leonard's healthy, playing at a all NBA level, and should be you know get some consideration for MVP as well. Paul George is playing terrific. I like the depth of the team. Uh, they have ascended essentially to the top of the Western Conference now. I think there's a game out of first place. Um, so I like what they did. It's made them really. Uh, one of the odds on favorites to make it to the NBA finals. So uh, I've, I've got to start there. Um, then I've got to go to the New York Knicks. Um, the Knicks, I thought, did a terrific job of addressing a number of needs. First, you know, we discussed the OG trade from about a month ago, uh, adding a big, versatile defensive wing. He's come in. We've seen the fruits of that trade for them already. I mean, they had a great uh, January and he was a big part of it. He is fit in seamlessly playing alongside Brunson and Randall. You know, we, we knew he could spot up and shoot the three. He's been active without the ball, cutting to the basket, finishing strong at the rim. And he's defended all over the place. So uh, worked out very well. And then they go in the final day of the trade deadline and pick up, Alec Burks and Bojan Bogdanovic uh, from the Pistons uh, to really address what they lost in the trade. You know, losing Emmanuel quickly in, in the initial trade, getting the Ananobi. When they lost Emmanuel quickly, they lost 16 points a game off the bench. That explosive score who could, um, you know, change a game off the bench and, and, and the coaching staff could rely on it. Burks. Uh, brings that in a big way. And then to be able to double down and go get Bojan Bogdanovic, who probably is going to start right now with Julius Randle being down. He, and he was averaging 20 points a game in Detroit. Scott, I saw the injury report for the Knicks the other night. I was about to go get a Knicks uniform and suit up for them. They had eight <laughs> yeah. healthy guys. I'm like, guys, yes. if you need me, I'll catch the flight right now. Yes. Yeah, there's no question. And so these guys are going to help and be very helpful immediately and, and you had Burks and when to you make were, them deeper for the playoffs yes when, Burks when you, I was you, you had Burks yes, under coach yes, Tom Thibodeau Burks. as well absolutely um, so and that makes a difference I, you know when you can bring in a player especially for a team like the Knicks where chemistry is so vital and so important to what they do you know they, everybody understands their roles on that team right now so you want when you've trade for someone you want to make sure that they're going to fit with the group Burks already has played with the majority of those guys in that uh, locker room and the coaching staff knows him very well. So there's going to be trust. That'll be a seamless transition. And if all I know, uh, from what I know about uh, Bogdanovich, it shouldn't be that much uh, more he's difficult for him. He's a, yeah, uh, he's a professional. And, and he can shoot the ball. Now look, now look at the Knicks. Look at the shooting that they can put on the floor. We talk about shooting all the time. You know, you can have Brunson, uh, Bogdanovich, DiVincenzo, Ananobi, DiVincenzo has been a flamethrower yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and Burks, you know, you're looking, all these guys are, uh, are shooting north of 37% from three this year. So now, you know, this team is going to be very vulnerable from the perimeter. And then you put in Randall, who is just a big time scorer from all over the court. Knicks have put themselves in the position to be a very tough out come playoff time. Yeah, they they were um, one of my teams that, that they were my mm -hmm. big winner because they've added size and shooting. You know, the, at their mm -hmm. positions, those guys have good size and shooting. And then contractually, when you look at the when you look at the books, Burks is a free agent this summer, so his salary can come off the books or they can resign him. Mm -hmm. And then Bojan as well, he has one year left on his deal. So next season, 
you know, this is the thing with Fournier because they weren't playing Fournier. And even right. if they didn't trade him, they could have used him next season as part of a deal. Whereas now they can do that with Bojan if they don't need him next year and they need to move salary as part of a deal because they managed to keep hold of a bunch of their picks. There's no question. And Bojan's contract for next year, I think, is only guaranteed about $3 million of that 19 that he's on the, on the books for. So a lot of flexibility there uh, for the Knicks uh, in that deal. And the last team for me, and this is a, maybe a little sleeper team, sleeper pick, I'm going to say the Phoenix Suns. Oh. Given the limited resources they had due to their salary cap situation, they still went out and made a move that I think is going to be very helpful to their cause come playoff time, going to get a guy like Royce O'Neal. And then they added the kid uh, David Roddy from Memphis as well. Now you're getting some toughness, versatile defenders that they need. They've got enough scoring. Big body Roddy. BJ yes. was asking when we discussed this Phoenix trade the other day on the show, he didn't see where Royce O'Neal fit in to that team. Mm -hmm. So how do you see his role being in Phoenix? Well, I just I just think you you get a, a guy who can defend on the wing, give you minutes on the wing, versatile, can defend two, three for sure. Uh, and he can spot up and make threes as well. I think that it's important to have those role players like that uh, on your team, uh, especially a team that's built so offensively dominant with the the three guys that they have in, in Durant, uh, Booker, and Bradley Beal. So I like it uh, for them. I think it's a sleeper move for them. I think it's going to solidify their position right now in the Western Conference. I think they're number five mm -hmm. and possibly be able to move up a spot. I'm sure they're going to you know, at least try to get – into that fourth spot where they can have home court advantage for the opening series. Um, but I like it. I think, you know, anytime you get solid players and that's why I said this an underrated move. And that's, I give them a win for that. Yeah. Uh, I think they were lacking a little depth too. And, and you know, it can add a little physicality to your group too. So I, I, I like the move. So BJ, which of the three teams you have down as your winners from the trade deadline? Winners, winners. Um, you know, I, I, to, I, to me, it's it's a it's a, it's it's one of those words. For the reason being that I don't like to use, especially when we talk about sports, is because you have to wait and see. And Scott just gave in a, a prime example with the L.A. Clippers. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a huge fan of the James Harden trade when they first made it. I was like, oh, what's going on here? Suddenly now they were tied for first place in the conference. And you just never know how things are going to work. And sometimes you get a group together and they'll have a chemistry that you just didn't plan on. You know, sometimes you'll get a player, you'll get the, you'll get a player put into a trade and, and the throw in, like, I remember the throw in player for that trade that ended up working for the Boston Celtics was Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. And then suddenly it just like, boom. And you go, what? I, I didn't expect this. Or sometimes you on paper, it sounds good, looks good, and then it just doesn't work. So if you're asking me, you know, who I think, the, I, I think the, I think the Clippers, and I agree with Scott, and I agree with Scott with this. I, I, I was trying to figure out the other day, so I've been watching the Clippers a lot lately, of why this is working. Like, I just not enough for it to say, oh, it's working, and give Ty Lue credit and the players credit, give all those guys credit. However, I came to the conclusion, and I don't know if you guys agree with this or not, is when you look at at small ball in the NBA, they're the best team in the league that can play small ball, even though those guys are all six five, six six, and six seven. They're yeah. the best small ball team in the NBA. And then, and then the point guard that comes off their bench, they use him a lot like a big. Like they're using Russ mm -hmm. as the screener in a screen roll. They're using Russ in a dunker spot because he has that vertical explosiveness to play taller than what he is. Yeah, yeah well, you can't play small ball versus them. Like, yeah, because they're bigger they're, at every position. <laughs> they're they're bigger at every position, but all their guys play small, like Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, James Harden, uh, you know, and they and they're the best at it. And I was like, wow, now they're the best small ball team in the NBA, even though they're not small, but they're not big. Yeah, because they only know, play with like, like one traditional big. Yeah, so, so I was mm -hmm. so I was looking at them. I like teams who address their needs, right? I have to give the Knicks credit for addressing their situation and what they did. I give them, I give them credit. Like 
they had a need their their team their group their 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 executive they made it they addressed their need so i i respect that i i respect what they what they did and and how they done it now there's another team and we don't have to revisit what you know what they've done scott did that but there's another team i also thought addressed their need and quietly they're going about their business kind of under the radar and that's okc they have been a team, team yeah that's been a team that you know they've you know they they get so much in the headlines in the news mo loves talking about you know these guys got a hundred draft picks now right they got mm-hmm. they got they got <laughs> draft picks everywhere you know I they think, got draft I picks i think I think that we need to send Sam Presti to draft picks anonymous at some point because it's yes. getting out of hand. It's getting but way out of hand. What he's done with Gordon Hayward signaled to me for the first time that they understand the importance now. They got to win. <laughs> okay? Like I'm not saying it's it's a comparison because of the player, but when the Warriors went and got Andre Iguodala as an experienced player to come off their bench, mm-hmm. do you see anything mm-hmm. similar in that? You know, you've got your younger superstars and now you're bringing in more experience who's, you know, been a star in their career before and now they're coming in for a lesser role to kind of pass on that knowledge. It, it, no, I, I think to both of you guys' point, they know, look, the window is now. You know, they can talk about, you know, well, we're young and we're going to push it up. You don't know what's going to happen next season. Look at Memphis. Yeah, exactly. You don't know what can happen year to year with injuries, a lot of things, you know, Poor play, a lot of stuff can happen. So they realize, look, they're sitting at the top of the Western Conference. So they went out and got a veteran player who can has some versatility to his game on the offensive side of the floor. Experience, he's gonna fit the group. You know, he's a professional guy, and um, they've got to try to make you know make us take a stab at it, try to make a deep run in these playoffs. Um, They got to at least get to the second round. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah you, especially you know, if you're because, a top two seed. Well, and it's it, when you're a young team like that, the more playoff experience you can get, if you're trying to ascend to be, become a champion one day, you want to get in as many playoff battles as you can. And uh, you, you don't want to just be one round and out uh, if you can help it. So uh, I think that was, you know, that was an, another team that I had as, as someone who could win um, or was, you know, a winner. Yeah, so to speak, yep. on pay on paper right now. Because to BJ's point, when mm-hmm. you talk about trades, and I used I used to say this all the time when the trade deadline was over, and everybody's you know getting grades passed out, and you know this team gets an A, this team gets a D, and all the talking heads are saying what they're saying, and I used to always say, well, we still got to play basketball, actually. Once yeah, and, yep. and, and once we play basketball, then we can come back and mm. revisit and get the real grades. Well, I had the Knicks down. I had OKC down. The third team I had down was my very own Boston Celtics because we spoke last <laughs> week about their need for depth. They added some depth at the big man position. They've got a great perimeter defender in Jaden Springer. You know, they have all the scoring. Brad Stevens even came out and said they've got all the scoring. They needed to add some defense, and that's exactly what they did. And I'm telling you now, there will be a game in the playoffs where everyone watches. I think this Xavier Tillman guy can really play defense. I can see it already. So okay, the, okay, yeah, wait and see. Z- 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 yeah. We're just gonna wait well, and see. Well, I know Xavier. I know Xavier Tillman is is tough. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna give you that. He's gonna give him some physicality. I feel like without Marcus Smart and, and, as well, you know, they need that toughness. And, 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 and you know, when you come up playing in a, in a place like Michigan, because he's a Grand Rapids native. <laughs> and Michigan mm-hmm. State guy. So uh I got to know Xavier a little bit through the draft process. So good good team guy, good fit. It'll be interesting to see how quickly they get him involved and what the minute distribution will be for him. Yeah. And he's great insurance as well. If uh, anything happens to pausing it or Horford, he's there. Um, but the losers of the trade deadline. Because I think this is easier to say who's a loser because they're for example, one of my losers on this is the Chicago Bulls, who haven't made a trade since 2021. So you can say, let's see what it's like on the court. Well, it's going to be the same thing we've been seeing 
where your general manager is convinced that he's built a contender who's going to barely be in the play in season after season. So, like, yeah. that's one of the teams I have as the he's, losers of the I, trade I, deadline. Yeah, I, a- and Mo, I, I, I had them as well. And again, look, it's their prerogative to, you know, to decide, hey, we don't want to blow this thing up and try to rebuild it from scratch. I get it because people don't understand how difficult that is to say, all right, we're just going to trade off all of our, you know, viable players and good players and just, you know, build through the draft and go through this four or five, six year rebuild. Like it's going to automatically turn around after that time. It doesn't have to happen. That's, that that's so correct. I, I, However, yeah. you're going so through I understand the, the dilemma. <laughs> so, but, but, but the point I was going to make though, but yeah. if you're going to stay eight, nine, 10, you got to try to make some kind of move to add to that group to see if that group can ascend from that level and get into the top six. And by not trying to make any trade in the last two and a half years, to me, you haven't done that. You've you just kind of, you know, sat on your hands a little bit. And uh, that's going to be, you know, difficult. Kobe, now look, Kobe White has really been a revelation for them this year is playing terrific basketball, is coming into his own. And maybe internally they think that he's going to be a guy that can help uplift the current group Mm -hmm. a few spots ahead. I'm assuming that probably must be their thought in terms of that by not doing anything at the deadline. There won't be no bull slander here. Okay, okay, BJ. The entire time they've had Demar Derozan, they've made no trades involving a player. (laughs) Right now, you've got the opportunity with all the leverage in the world for a player like Alex Caruso to go out and get multiple first round picks. Um, Andre Drummond, another player who's a free agent this summer. This was your chance to have a return come in for him uh, because he could leave for nothing this summer. So you could have traded Andre Drummond for a younger player who maybe has the potential to develop and help your team more next season when Zach Levine's back or whatever it might be, rather than just standing pat and he walks in free agency. So, and I'm, I'm sure they got a lot of calls about Andre Drummond. Yep. Too. Yep. They definitely yeah, did. Lot, there were a lot of teams and you start with Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Was one, they, sure. they definitely did. Which were the other teams you had Scott then on your list of the losers of the trade deadline? Well, Houston didn't make a deal. And a little surprising to me, you know, some people might say, well, well, you know, Houston is a younger team. But let's not forget that Houston this past summer went out and gave a large contract to Fred Van Vliet, went out and got Jeff Green. Uh, The team has been very good winning at home. I know the coach there, uh, Ime Udoka, is trying to at minimum get into the play-in with a chance to be in the playoffs this year. So I was just a little surprised, you know, that they didn't go out and do something to add to that group to help solidify themselves at minimum in the playing uh, round. So that was another one of the teams. Yeah, I I heard that Ime Adoka was making a big push to try and get, you know, a trade to that will help them push up into the playoff positions this season. But a, a few members of their front office had the, Opposite opinion. Um, who is the third team on your list? I went back and forth uh, between Portland. Uh, I, I don't know kind of what direction they're yep. going right now. <laughs> uh, and Denver. And I hesitate to put Oof. to say Denver because they're so good. And I think they still really have a legit chance to repeat. But we've talked about this on the show before. I still really would have liked to see them address their bench to some degree. Uh, That's the one thing that I'm not sure of going into the playoffs. I'm not sure that they're totally comfortable with what they have in the locker room right now. You know, we talked about Jeff Green and we talked about Bruce Brown and what they meant to that ball club last year. I mean, they, you know, they don't win the championship without them. Obviously, you know, the Joker is the, the center of the universe there, of course they don't win if he's not there. But role players like that and and so pivotal uh, when trying to win a series and who's going to be that for them this year. Now, again, they were challenged like the Phoenixes of the world and Milwaukee's and all these teams and uh, the Clippers uh, in terms of the salary cap 
uh, constraints. So I know, and and not having many assets to go out and do much. So I get that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that uh, they will try to figure out, be able to do something in the buyout market to add to their bench. But again, they're gonna be a little restricted there because anybody with a pre-existing salary of above twelve point four million dollars, if they're bought out, mm -hmm. Denver's not gonna be able to go after that player. So they're going to be looking at a pool of guys that are below $12.4 million. BJ, which were the three teams you saw as the losers of the trade deadline? And I know you ain't oh. going to say your Pistons or your Bulls, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say my Pistons. Hey, I think the Bulls. Pistons yeah, were absolutely. a winner, man. They finally free of Monty Williams' obsession of playing Killian Hayes over everyone else. So <laughs> I think that's a win for Detroit. Hey, hey, respectfully. Because hey, hey, hey. i got there a lot of love be, for Killian uh, Hayes. Mo, but there, will be no, there will be no slander of, of, two, of two teams here. Oh, two BJ, teams. you must not know me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When I look at, you say loser, I just say I look at organizations for whatever the reason may be. Like, you know, it's interesting listening to what Scott said with Denver. However, you know, as an executive, I always take into consideration any trade that I would do or recommend is the chemistry within a team. And when you have a championship level chemistry, you have to be, in my opinion, I don't know if Scott agrees or not, is you have to be very careful for what you bring into your group, to your existing group, because you practice with a championship level mentality. OK, this isn't a, a place of experimenting. You, They know they have a championship level team. And I happen to agree with the fact of what I think they're doing. I don't know this is you're just going to look for the buyout. You're going to look for some low hanging fruit to say where a, a player gets traded or bought out unexpectedly and suddenly they can go there. Now, however, I mean, Scott made a good point, you know, it limits their market of players that will exist in that. But I think there will be some good players. I always think they're good players. You just got to try to find a player that will fit into who you are. In saying all of that, my thing is looking at two or three teams that I thought, wow, I didn't understand what they're doing. As far And when I say understand, I didn't think they addressed their needs. One was a, one of the teams I think, you know, I know Scott and I do. I don't know what Mo is, the Sacramento Kings. Yeah, I agree. I, I didn't think they addressed the one thing that's glaring to me when you watch them, they can score, they can get up and down. They have two players that are arguably all stars. One of them is leading the league right now in in triple doubles and Sabonis. Doubles. Yeah, double doubles. Uh, yeah, double mm -hmm. doubles or triple. I think he's leading in is triple. Is he doubles, in triple doubles right? as well? Yeah, I think he's leading in triple double. I think mm -hmm. he just overtook uh, Jokic. Yeah. Okay, and then nice. they didn't address that toughness that we. Right. It's been a glaring I weakness think. for them. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's been a glaring saw, it, for it was in HD in the playoffs last year Draymond Green yes. punked them like well, they I'm not saying it, that it, but I'm <laughs> saying yeah. that you can <laughs> say whatever you want I'm going <laughs> to say it he but, stamped but, on your boy's chest while he was laying on the floor and not one of you did nothing that, yeah, but you, you you, I've seen you've seen it this season even in the regular season yes. games when teams have decided to ramp up the physicality, physicality. they don't match it, that it, moment and th this is a yeah. team as we all know, when you when your window of opportunity knocks and says it's time for us to win, you got to go for it because you never yeah. know what's going to happen in the future. So I I would have liked to see the Kings, you know, I, and I, and I know they probably like their group, but I would like mm -hmm. to have seen them try to do something to address to me a glaring. Yeah, they if, if right. I would have just gone off to OG they, they, if I was I saw, yeah, I, I saw that with the Kings, but they did pick up. Uh, Robin Lopez. Yeah, but they they they, they, they waved him though. They, they waved, waved him. him. Yeah, that's why he was seeing yeah. on the okay. on the sidelines reading his bookie and popcorn yeah, at the Bucks game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, um, you know, but can I just want to add one thing, or really just enhance one point that BJ made about trades and the trade deadline. You know, often when the public or fans, you know, talk about trades, you know, you ought to trade for player A or player B and and all that they're considering at that time when they're talking about it is the player's skill set and the player's stat line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those are two very important things. But there's a third thing called person, personality. Mm -hmm. And they're not, 
none of those are mutually exclusive. They all come together. So when you trade for a player, you're trading for all of those things. And so that person and personality that you're bringing into your building, you got to make sure that he's, you've done your due diligence and you're going to believe that he's going to fit with the other personalities that are in your locker room. And he's going to fit with the personality of the coach because no, ma no matter how good those other two things are, if they're not a fit, it's not going to work as well. And so at that point, you, you know, so when, as you were using that in relation to Denver, I agree totally with what you're saying um, about that. Um, that is a huge component to a trade that I don't think gets talked about enough uh, when analysts are talking about, you know, who to trade for, what to shoot. It's about yeah, the human. And that's what makes, and that's what really what makes the Knicks deals, you know, resonate well. You know, obviously I have a feel for that situation, but they've stayed true to um, the personalities in their locker room. So people that they've been bringing in are going to fit with that existing group. And um, so. Absolutely. So BJ, yeah. you've got the Kings, which are the other two teams that kind of disappointed you at the trade? This may be some, this may be a surprise to many because of the quality of the player that, that they received at the trade when they made this trade would be the Indiana Pacers. And the reason I say the Indiana the buddy, Pacers. Are you talking about the Buddy Hill trade or the Siakam trade? I'm talking about the Siakam trade. Mm -hmm. Siakam is a very, very, very good player. Very good player. However, I have to go back to the in-season tournament wherein all of us in the media were singing their praises for the team and how well they were playing as a group. Mm -hmm. When, For some reason, when things work, it just clicks with your team. I would argue that as good of a player that they that they got back in return, something is going on with their team where it's not translating to wins at this particular time with their group. And in my opinion, they're not playing at the same level they were that I saw them earlier in the season. Mm -hmm. Some so, of those been injuries, do, to you, be fast do, 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 do you think guys are deferring to him a little bit because he's coming in with some status or is he trying to do too much? What are you seeing? Um, well, I, I think yeah. what you pointed out to me is when you trade a guy, you see the stats, right? <laughs> you see the talent, you see, you see the talent, set. you see all of that experience. And, and wow. You, you listen, when you, when you have an opportunity to get a player like that, that has to, that that's an internal conversation you have to have. I mean, that's, I mean, Siakam is an all-star caliber player. Yes. However, sometimes your team just works for that group. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes, it, and you have to consider that and take that in. It's going to be fascinating for me to watch because how, what, I mean, we were talking, they were, we were all singing how well they were, Halliburton, oh, he was fabulous. And then Obi right. Toppin was starting and mm -hmm. Matherin. And I mean, everything was going right for them. And Bruce Brown was good mm -hmm. for them as well. Bruce Brown, Bruce Brown. and Buddy yeah. oh, no Hill. Yeah. And, and I get mm -hmm. it. I get it. It worked. I don't know why it worked, but it worked. They were in the championship game. And we we're saying, wow, this, this is a team we got to watch out in the Eastern Conference. Suddenly after they made the trade, with the expectations, you go, wow, well, look how well they were playing here. They're going to get Siakam. And now you're looking at them going, wow, this, I don't know what's going on over there. I meaning, right. meaning because, I mean, look, injuries happen, but we got to take that. But, in. That's part of the game. Having, having said that, it's a mid-season trade, which is always tough to pull off. And then you look at, for example, the Rudy Gobert deal in Minnesota. The first season, everyone was saying that was an awful trade for them, and it just took them a year to figure that out. And, and, so and that, they might get to next season this time, and they might be flying to the Eastern Conference. The, 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 the difference is, is and, and, and you're right, Mo. That's a, a very valid point. But now you're going to have to sign Pascal Siakam this summer. Max contract. Deal. Yeah, to a very big deal. 
And if the results are still uneven at that time, and you know, and what they gave up, they've you know, kind of they've silently well, committed to doing well, that. Well, I have a question. So do you not, think? You know, do you think Pascal Siakam now is better than he was when the Raptors won their championship in 2019? Well, I think he's more confident in who he is and what he can get accomplished as a player in the league. You know, I don't ability ability know, wise, do you, do you ability think wise, right now on ability the court, wise. he's better than Scott? Okay, can I say? Can I say this? I, I want to okay. say this. Okay, okay. Do I think he's better? Unless, I, I, again, I know I'm older, so I you guys help me out here. The guy who was the main guy that was carrying that team, it's Kawhi, was Kawhi. Yeah, yeah. So this is the, this is why the, I'm asking the, the question the, because the leadership yeah. of the team was coming from Kyle Lowry. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Van Fleet. They had Paul Gasol. I mean, not Mark Paul, Gasol. But Mark Gasol Serge was Ibaka. another guy who was mm -hmm. a stretch player. You know, he was. Yep. A, he was just. And he and, and he was a midseason acquisition too. He was a midseason acquisition. Okay, mm -hmm. but the thing that was fascinating to me was Pascal Siakam wasn't. You know, when you came to the scouting report, he wasn't the guy saying we got to stop Pascal. Yeah, so oh, so no. this is this he is was he, 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 he was he was fourth on he was fourth he was on the fourth on the, the, on, the oh, on the chart. Oh no, but, okay. It, now it, 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 did you the fourth? But now, mm -hmm. in my opinion, he is first or second on the list. Right. Yes. I, I think and it's fair to say though he was the second best player on that championship team. We're not saying he wasn't. Just like we can say that we but, can but say just, when we could say hold on more. We can mm -hmm. say that Wiggins was arguably the second best player on their championship <laughs> run too. <laughs> Yeah, you can you can yeah, say yeah, these yeah, things. Yeah. So so, but this is well, why I'm asking the question. Do you think if you think he's better now that the improvement from him between 2019 and now is enough to be a contender? Because he's going to be the second best player on this team. Well, Halliburton, I don't think respectfully to Halliburton, I'm a huge fan of his game. I don't think he will ever be what Kawhi Leonard was on that 2019 run. So has Pascal Siakam improved enough since 2019 to compensate from the fact that you're not going to have a, a player of Kawhi Leonard's caliber. You're not going to have leadership like you had from Kyle Lowry. You're not going to have the experience of a former defense player of the year in Marc Gasol, as good as Miles Turner may be. Is the improvement from Pascal Siakam enough I'm, to become a true well, contender? I, I'm going to throw this to Scott. I'm going to throw this to Scott, but say this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you're putting together a championship team, when you're putting together a team, what you're asking is the executives to put players in their right role. You are who you are. I mean, this guy is arguably, not arguably, he's a 20-point scorer. I don't care if he's first, yeah. second, or third. He's a. But it's my job to make sure, as an executive, you got to take some responsibility. Well, he's got to improve. He's... It is different. It is different playing as the third or fourth option than playing as the first or second option. Mm -hmm. That's a different game. That's a different responsibility. And right. I'm not sure just yet that he consistently can play as the first or second option. I don't care about we the numbers he puts up. It's just is what it is. However, what is the responsibility? I would I say to Scott to make sure that they put the group around him that will support what he does well and what he doesn't do well. And, and, and that's not a knock against anybody's game. Every yeah. player has a, as has deficiencies in their game, but how, what is the responsibility for the executives and the coaching staff and all those people as well? Well, I think a couple of things, and I'm going to throw a question out before I get too deep in it. Toronto had this guy all the time and they watched his individual stats grow from the time they won the championship up until, you know, this season where they ultimately traded him. And they decided to trade him. If he, I would have to believe if they thought, again, I don't want to speak for him, but if I'm sitting in their position, if I thought I had a number one or two option who was going to make players around him better, I'm keeping it. And, and you would have traded Scotty Barnes for a number one option. Like, remember the, when would, Kevin Durant it, it, was available, right, thinking, they wanted Scotty Barnes in return I, I and they refused. The danger here, when you start talking about players, you know, getting better, scoring points, all those things, again, and, and, and I like the guy. 
uh, Pascal Siakam. I like his game because he plays hard every night. I never have to question his effort. But what I see in him is a guy that plays more like in his own silo, if you will. Mm -hmm. That he is aggressive, attacking the score, but he's not really totally aware of this, okay, how I'm going to get uh, Obi Toppin playing better tonight or Ben Matherman playing better tonight and, you know, kind of picking and choosing my spots. He just kind of goes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not being critical of that, but that's his style of game. So if I know that, and now Halliburton is there as my leader and my point guard, I don't want to put Pascal Siakam in a situation where he's going to fail by asking him necessarily to be this leader or change how he plays. I'm, you know, the pace has made, you know, I think Halliburton being a little younger than him, it'll be, what I see is going to be a challenge for him now to grow as a man and as a leader and to be vocal and make sure that everybody knows okay, this is my team and this is how things are going to work. And he's going to, and, and, and Pascal is going to have to understand that, even though he's brought there to be a key piece, but I don't think he was brought there to be the lead piece. And uh, I, that's what I see right now with the Pacers. Mm-hmm. And it's still a work in progress. The playoffs to me is always the final proven ground. And when you really want to know what your team is, get locked into a playoff series. Mm-hmm. And BJ can tell you that all too well because now the playoff series is going to tell you who everybody is on your roster. Yep. Even the guys that don't play. Yep. You're going to learn a <laughs> so, lot about people. No, seriously. Yeah. It's because you're going to see just how people are engaged and and how they respond to their first and second strengths being taken away. Because that other team you're playing against is going to be that prepared to play yeah. against you. So, so BJ, who's the third team you have? Because you've got the uh, Kings, the Pacers, and and who's the third the Kings, one? Kings, uh, the Pacers. Man, that was a good discussion. I, I, I was I was learning was, as we were talking. There. Yeah, I was fantastic. learning stuff. And then uh, my third team was, again, when I see teams not addressing the obvious, was the Charlotte Hornets. I, mm. I, I, I just didn't understand... Mm. Okay, I, I get it, right? Rozier, you're moving out, but then what you're getting back in return. And then I don't know if you guys have been following this. You know, the 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 post game, I follow their post game coaches uh the, 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 press the, conferences. The, the press conference. I follow him. He he's classic, the things he's been saying. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you guys. I mean, yep, Mo. Yep, I mean, yep, Mo. Yep. You got to pull these. You have to pull these clips up, Mo. I mean, I don't know what is going on there in Charlotte right now. I don't know what's going on. I don't even have a comment. I can't even comment. So, and then they get back Grant Williams, and then they're, they're doing yeah. things. But I, I mean, can you just give just Mo? Can you just give some of the the post game? <laughs> Press conferences that or, or yeah. something that he said. Yeah, those guys didn't play well. Because of problems. The expectations are so much different than when I was here before. You know, those guys didn't play well back well. They heard about it, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And these guys need to hear about it too, because they're good enough to play better too. And I need to hear about it too. That's all fine. That's part of this. But to say let's let's find out what's good. Let's not. Let's just tell the story. Okay. The bench was embarrassing. Was- <laughs> the bench was embarrassing. <laughs> Let me, let me, I'll put up a few more, but um, yeah, I, I do it, love it, his post-game rants. Here, check this one out. Got to stop with that shit. Like, like, you know what? You either one of your most were good enough to win a winnable game. We had shots too, and there's none of this anymore. You know, we play hard. We're not doing that anymore. <laughs> so, I, I don't know what's going on down there, Charlotte. Yeah, I, 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 so I'm just saying, I'm, I don't know what they're, what, if you said what's their direction and what they're trying to do based on the moves yeah. that I've this, seen. This them. was my favorite one. Should they, I play this they, one real quick? Yeah. They ahead. may not. Uh, the last three games, we've been pretty good on offense. We are playing no defense, not one guy. 
There's not a bright spot. Raymond, a lot of frustration. In the- he says, we're playing no defense. There's not one guy. There's no bright spots on this team defensively. Yeah, so... So, so, I, so I, Yeah, those are my three teams. So... I can't say that the, the Hornets are losers because I have zero expectations from them. I never have and I never will because they are just the Charlotte Hornets. Um, but speaking <laughs> of the Hornets, the one of the losers for me, I already said the Bulls, but I think the Dallas Mavericks were losers in this really? because if Steve Clifford is saying that about his team, there's no defense, not one guy. He's, no one's making the right pass. They're just dribbling too much. Why are the Dallas Mavericks giving up their last valuable future asset, a 2027 first round pick to go out and acquire the third best player on the Charlotte Hornets. Is that really going to be the guy that turns you from where are they right now in the Western conference? They're eighth in the West. Are you really going to become a sixth uh, top 16 with PJ Washington? Like when I first heard about the trade, I thought, you know, in theory it could work quite well. And then I really went and looked at it and PJ Washington's three point shootings declined every year. His effort on defense is not there to be found. And you're trading away Grant Williams, who you traded a pick swap for this summer to get. And then you're adding a first round pick in order to get rid of him now. And I'm just looking at it like, so your two moves at the deadline are trading for the third best player on the Hornets and the third best player on the Washington Wizards. Two of the worst teams in basketball right now. They're (laughs) combined. They've won 19 games all season, the Charlotte Hornets and the Washington Wizards. And so this is your move with Kyrie and Luka to try and move up in the Western Conference is to trade for those two guys. Daniel Gafford, who they acquired, can't play at the same time as Derek Lively. So you've essentially traded a future first round pick swap for a backup center. That's cool. You could have got one of those guys on the buyout market. I think Daniel Gafford's a good player. Don't get me wrong. But you're just giving away all of your future assets for what? Like... Teams give away all their future af- assets to trade for superstars. You're giving them away for rotation players. And I just look at this, and now you've given away all your future picks. If you get to the 2026 season and Luka Doncic decides not to take his player option and he's tired of losing in Dallas because everywhere else he's ever been in his career, in Real Madrid and whatnot, he's been a winner. And he decides he wants to go and play with a Nikola Jokic or he decides he wants to go and play elsewhere in the NBA – then Luca goes, you have none of your own picks. Those picks are going to rival teams and you're left with what? You're left with nothing. So in my opinion, I've got the Dallas Mavericks as, as losers of this trade deadline. And then I look at the reasons why they reported, I think uh, someone from ESPN reported, why did they trade Grant Williams? Oh, he rubbed some people the wrong way. He stopped wearing Lucas sneakers and wore Jason Tatum sneakers instead. I'm sorry, but if you're trying to win a championship, who cares? what sneakers someone is wearing right. to play basketball. Right. Is, do you really think, do you really think, right, that Luka Doncic went to the front office and said, Grant Williams, stop wearing my shoes. You guys have got to trade him. No, I don't. So I don't know what's no. going on in the Dallas right. front office, but leaking that to ESPN, I think is just pathetic. Like, this is your logic for trading a guy. He wore someone else's shoes. Get the hell out of here. We saw Manu Ginobili wearing LeBron's to play against LeBron in the NBA Finals. Why do you yeah, care what, yeah. shoes, what shoes right. the guy's wearing? This is ridiculous mm-hmm. to me. So I, I got the Dallas Mavericks down as, as losers at a trade deadline because have they addressed their need for a wing defender? Because the rumors were all about Andrew Wiggins or a player who could play that three slash four position. Is PJ Washington really going to be that guy? Are you going to take him from a losing culture? Now, what's he going to add, be, uh, Scott, as you talk about that human aspect? What's he adding to your locker room coming from Charlotte where those guys are known for buying jewelry and sipping lean? What is he adding to this culture in Dallas if you're trying to win a championship? I don't know what that I don't know who's making these decisions. I don't know if Mark Cuban's checked out and he said, yeah, take that microphone. Take that microphone. Take that microphone. Mo, I didn't know you were so adamant against uh, the, the Mavericks because I, I wouldn't have placed them as losers at the deadline mm-hmm. do you this think is, that they've improved no, their team enough to justify no, giving well, up all their future I, assets this, obviously they think they've improved their team and that's the most important thing for right now yeah i, I may be wrong they, they might yeah, improve loads yeah, so i may they, be wrong they see they it's seen the need they to get a four man who could stretch the floor and i hear what you're saying about the numbers going down the last few years in in charlotte but to your point Things have been very bad in Charlotte. It has not been a, a, a professional environment there for some time. And that can, you know, and he's still a, a relatively young player. That can affect guys mentally. So I'm sure 
Dallas's front office is saying, hey, and and they watched this guy when he was back at college in Kentucky, and he was, you know, you know, a good prospect coming out of Kentucky, and he had some fight in him. So I'm sure they feel okay, we can bring him in here to a winning environment and kind of polish him up again, build him up again to be able to provide what they need. And you mentioned Daniel Gafford. Yeah, Lively is the guy moving forward, but he's not ready to play 48 minutes. So now you've got a, kind of a two-headed monster uh, defensively uh, on the interior for the team, and, and they yeah, need but, but that. And, this... and I think – and here's what they're having to do. you got to understand the pressure there. Because you mentioned it about Luka a few years out from being a free agent again. Front office guys will be trying to do something to – make this team better today while you got Luca and Kyrie and hopefully those guys can add enough depth and, and again, PJ, some shooting rim protection from uh, Daniel Gafford that they can get locked into a series and, you know, advance beyond the first round, be competitive to at least get in the second round. And then who knows from there, when you got a great player like Luca, he could go off one series against any of those teams and help you get to the finals. I just think that's what the thinking is in Dallas right now. And like I tell you all the time, this we got to play basketball now. I see BJ <laughs> got his hands up. Well, on that, <laughs> I learned this from I learned this from Mo. Mo is amazing at the narratives of what's going on out there. <laughs> Mo will get Mo. You say who is the internet? Mo yeah. may be the internet. He's in the inner circle <laughs> of the internet. Now I don't know how Mo. But, 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 I don't know how Mo knows what he. You know, you know what you know, and you know what you don't know. If I want to know what's going on in social media or anything, I just mm. I just got to call Mo, and Mo will tell me what the internet. I don't. I've never met the internet, but Mo will tell me what the internet is saying. And I say the following. The Dallas Mavericks have a narrative that's out there in the ether that says the following. They lost Jalen Brunson literally for nothing. And they're going to have to answer that question. And there will be someone, not Mo, but there will be someone who's just waiting to remind Luca of what they had when Jalen Brunson was there, if I remember correctly, they went to the conference finals. Right? Yep. They and and Luca yes, missed a few yeah, games yeah, in that first, first round series I against Utah, correctly. and Brunson came up huge for them. Conference. Now, absolutely, if, he was big. if, he was if big. they don't re, if they don't get back to the, that level, yeah, they've got to get to that someone point. within the the other twenty nine teams in the NBA. I'm sure they're going to remind Luca of that. And there's going to be a narrative that I'm sure someone already has it teed up. Not Mo, but someone has it teed up on their... <laughs> <laughs> they already oh, talk about it all the time. Yeah. Stephen A already talks about it all the time. And and that to me is in the, it's looming in the building to every... They have to do something. Now, I don't know yeah. what the something is, Yeah, they, but they're going to have to answer that question. And that narrative to me is putting a lot of pressure on no, this organization I, to do something. I, th th there's no question. That's why I said they, th that's why they made this move here. Now, whether it's going to work to that level, we got to wait and see. But there was no way they could sit on their hands and not do anything during this period. Yeah. To well, you guys, and you guys are both. Well, the, the reason why I say that is it's not so much the players they return got in return. Because like you said, PJ Washington, he might, his career might turn around now. He's with a, a somewhat successful franchise and Daniel Gaff is a very solid player, but it's the giving up the future assets when Luca yeah. could potentially walk, which is the same thing we say about the Lakers, which is why for my final loser to trade deadline is LeBron James, mm. because he was putting out his cryptic tweets and alluding to things in interviews that he wants them to make a move and they didn't make a move. So shout out to LeBron. I know he's chasing championships number five and six to catch up with MJ, but uh, I don't know if they picked up Spencer Dinwiddie today, but I don't know if that's the move that's going to take them from the ninth seed right now to the, the top contender in the Western Conference. So I say all of that to say this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the three of us, we gave our top five contenders 
in the NBA right now. And I want to know since then how things have changed. So Scott, we'll start with you. And last time you had the Celtics at one, the Clippers at two, the Bucks at three, the Nuggets at four, and the Sixers at five. What is your current list of contenders in the NBA? Okay. I had to drop out the Sixers, obviously, because of the Joel Embiid situation. So I'll start there. But pretty much the same teams, but added a new one to replace uh, Philadelphia. Oh, so the top four and remain I, the no, same? No, no. I'm going to switch the, 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 the names may uh, are, are, are the same, but the order is a little Okay, different. okay, okay. Let's start five and then go to one. Okay. Five. Phoenix Suns. Oh, okay. Ooh, okay. Ooh. Without Royce O'Neal <laughs> moving the needle for exactly, you. Exactly. Huh? Yeah. Okay. I, hey, look, I gotta be consistent. I gotta be consistent with what I'm talking about now. Uh, four, Milwaukee Bucks. Okay. Three, Denver Nuggets. Yep. Two, the Leprechauns. Boston Celtics. Ooh, we got a new entry at number one then, huh? But yes, yeah. Gonna change it up on you. I'm putting pressure on Clipperland. Number yeah, one, yeah, yeah. LA Clippers. Yeah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right, BJ. Okay, who did I have? I, I forgot let who me, I had. Let me remind you of yours. BJ, <laughs> you had at number five, the Philadelphia 76ers. At number four, the Denver Nuggets. At number three, the Phoenix Suns. At number two, the Milwaukee Bucks. And at number one, the Boston Celtics. Woo! Um, I had them at uh, okay. All right. So hit me starting at number okay. five. Okay. Well, five. Okay. Clearly, Joel is out. Right. I mean, that's just the obvious. Okay. Um. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna put the Milwaukee Bucks at five right now. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm dropping I'm down from number two to number five. Yeah, I, I, yeah, a lot has happened since we made that right. initial list, and mm -hmm. I'm not a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of Doc, as everyone knows. <laughs> we know too well, mm -hmm. but I'm not a huge fan of this move that was made mid-season. Mm -hmm. I'm just that, that I just think there's too you much. Mean, to oh, you mean the, the coaching change? You said the coaching change right, right. that was okay. made in the mid-season. Mm -hmm. Giannis is going to keep him competitive. However, right. I just think that's just a lot to overcome. So that's why I have them at number five. Okay. Okay. Uh, number four. Um, I'm going to say the Phoenix Suns at four. Okay. Sliding down one spot from three. I can't bet against the Joker. The Joker, the, the, the Joker's just yeah. too good. So he, you got him at three. I, I got him at three. I mean, mm -hmm. even though we know what they, I mean, he's in a seven game no, series. Yeah. He's just oh, too yeah, good. No. Yeah. Okay. Now top two. <laughs> Mo, I, I, I mean, Mo, you're, you're wearing the colors. I, 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 I can't not have them there. I mean, you can't have them there. <laughs> you got a season again, two? I, I I got to season two, and then I have to say this: I don't Brand know what else entry. to say. The the listen, I never, <laughs> I would be saying this. Yeah, the Clippers. If I'm just gonna say one guy, I'm just gonna make it simple. If Kawhi Leonard is healthy, mm -hmm. right? If he is healthy, mm -hmm. I just don't see anyone being able to match up with him. Okay, okay. Well, let me hit you with, yeah, with my list first before we, yeah, we dive yeah. into these, okay. right? So previously, I had the Clippers at five, Timbulls at four, Celtics at three, Sixers at two, and Nuggets at one. My list has changed a little bit. At number five, I've got the Timberwolves. At number four, I've got the New York Knicks. At number oh, wow. three, I've got the LA Clippers. <laughs> at number two, I've got my Boston Celtics. And at number one, I said it from last year, and I'm going to keep consistent the whole way through, Nikola Jokic and the Denver Nuggets. Okay. That's my okay. list. You guys have both got the Clippers at number one. Tell me why you think that they beat the Denver Nuggets in the seven game series. I like the depth 
of the of the team. And while nobody can stop the Joker, they've got Zubac, Plumlee, Tice. What's that? Eighteen fouls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's eighteen. I'm not, not sixteen made free throws. <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. I, look, but. No team over there in the West is going to have anybody that's going to, quote unquote, shut the Joker down. So, but I like the depth of this team. I like the toughness that's on this team. And then look, Denver's got to match up with them on the other end. You know, Aaron Gordon can't guard everybody. Yeah, that's a lot of pick and rolls for the Joker to be in. Exactly. No, I know, but I'm saying, but right, exactly. And they can put him in a lot of screen roll. Aaron Gordon, okay, were well, you going to try to put him on Kawhi Leonard? Okay, and Kawhi pulls him away from the basket, takes some, you know, away some of their interior defensive presence. But then, you know, who's going to match up with Paul George? You know, who's going to match up with James Harden? Um, so I just, you know, from a matchup situation, I like the, the Clippers are a tough team to guard against. They can score. I think they're going to be able to play different styles. They can play a little up tempo. They can play a little half court. Um, and just watching them right now, they look like the most complete team. Now, again, I'm not. If Denver were to beat them, would I be surprised? Shocked? Of course not. You know, they're the defending champions. But uh, as I sit here today, I think it it really gets down to the depth of the team, and then trying to match up with those three eventual Hall of Fame players that they have uh, on the perimeter. Well, one team that none of us have mentioned, uh, probably the best team in basketball over the past month, eight-game win streak right now, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yes. Why are they not featured in the top five of any of our lists? I just think we, we want to see them once they get to the playoffs. Yeah. You want to talk about who's playing the best, you know, in the regular season, one of the right regular season performance. Of course, you'd have to have them in there. Yeah, I, I want to see when, uh, what, when Moby gonna, returns as well, you know, how that yes, shifts the what, dynamic. What is going to happen when you get to the playoffs with the Cavaliers and what everybody will want to see? They have two excellent guards. But if you're putting uh, Donovan Mitchell back to the two-guard position and you know matching up with twos and then um, Garland matching up with ones, you're going to be small again. You're going to be small in the backcourt. So how deep a run can you make with a smaller backcourt in the playoffs? Once we see the, them advance and how they deal with that, then I think you can put them more into the conversation. But I, and I'm not sleeping on them. I think they're going to be a tough out. They're gaining more confidence. Uh, the additions they made in the offseason uh, with Struess and George Niang, again, not – high profile guys, but good, solid winning basketball players uh, has been very helpful to this team. Okay. Um, you guys have obviously got the Bucks in your top five. I don't have them. I respect it. I mean, Giannis, you can never bet against him. Yeah. I just don't think, you know, the midseason coaching change and Look, as much as Patrick Beverly can bring premier defense, I think Dame Lillard is still too much of a target on I, that side of the floor I, I, it's funny i because i struggled with them in phoenix in my order four and five initially i have phoenix even ahead of them and had milwaukee five um uh, it's just hard for me to <laughs> move on from Giannis. to be honest with you sometimes i you just you get him locked in the series but there are a lot of, of of the teams in that top five the biggest question mark for me right now, even though I have them at four, is the Bucks based on what we're seeing and how they're playing. What yep. we're, what I'm banking on and why I still have them in the list, aside from the Giannis factor, is that Dame Lillard will continue to figure it out. Doc's influence will grow and some, you know, and, and guys will start to buy in there. And I'm interested to see and we didn't talk about this as it related to the trade deadline, the Patrick Beverly edition. Mm -hmm. How helpful is that going to be to this team? Because it was a team that we know has not defended well, especially on the perimeter. What kind of impact does he make with this group? So that's why I still have them there to uh, to, to let all that gets flushed out. BJ, uh, two teams I have in my list that you guys don't have yours are the Timberwolves and the Knicks. Can you tell me why you don't have the Timberwolves in the top five contenders list right now? 
two things that are very important for me with any organization as you head into what to me is your, it, 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 it's what this league is all about, right? You can have a great regular season, but when you, you're going to find out who you are. I think Scott mentioned it earlier. Once the playoffs begin, no, there, 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 there's two things that I, I abide by and, and why I don't have those two teams in particular, the notoriety of a coach is always dictated by the execution of the players under pressure. Okay. You, you can have a great regular season, but I'm going to find out everything about, we talked about, we're going to find out about where your players, I'm going to find out everything about that coach Very from true. game to game. Mm -hmm. Okay. True. All right. Now, <laughs> if there's those two teams, right? Last year, we got a master class from Eric Spolstra. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, if you yeah. want to find out what the notoriety of a coach is, in my opinion, mm -hmm. you you just go back last year and just watch Eric Spoelstra from game to game. Mm -hmm. He 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 won some games for the for that for that. He won some series that, for that team. That, okay, yeah, yeah, no yeah, question. Okay, no, he, okay. He, was, he was phenomenal. Coach Malone, I thought, was unbelievable over there in the Western Conference. Yep, yep. especially in the finals, like okay. the, the moves he made to come at what. Eric Spoelstra right, was uh, doing defensively. That, it was fantastic. This is this is Excellent. now okay. Now, second, if you want to become a great player, right? I'm not talking about the regular season. If you want to become a, a great player, you have to execute in the playoffs. Now, I have yet to see anyone on any of those teams yet in the playoffs. They've some of them have been terrific. In the regular seasons, they've had all stars, very deserving. But if you want to be a great player now, and the playoffs begin, I haven't seen anyone yet. Now, when we talk about Minnesota, do I think Anthony Edwards has a talent? Oh, now you, you we know you know you, we you know, know what I feel know. about Ant Man, but he hasn't done it yet. Right. Okay, Jalen Brunson. J okay, yeah, we can bleed, but you got to show me though. Mm -hmm. You got to show me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jalen Brunson, Julius Randle, hey, regular season, hey man, Jalen Brunson right now, his name is Jalen Brunson was great in the playoffs though. Okay, but I, again, if you're going to do it, you're talking about top five, Mo. We we talking about conference finals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we talk about a different game now. We're not talking about playoffs, first round, Mo. We talking about you say we talking about a top five team. Okay, you didn't put four Eastern Conference teams on there. So that means mm -hmm. they should be in the conference finals. I, yep. If they get healthy, okay. I think they will be. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm just waiting to see it. I'm not saying they can't do it. I got to see it now. I so mm -hmm. I am evaluating everyone now by different standards of excellence. But so you, have the Clippers, you have the Clippers at one featuring Paul George and James Harden, who notoriously disappear no, 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 when, no, no. when it comes I, to the pressure being clear. on the line. Hold on, Mo. Mo, I've been very clear. I said Kawhi Leonard. I would. I've been very clear and very consistent. Kawhi Leonard is the player. If Kawhi Leonard is healthy, and he yeah. goes to the playoffs, I don't care if the other guys don't show up or do show up. If Kawhi Leonard is there, the Clippers okay. got it. Okay. They're they okay. gonna be good. Now that's what yeah, I yeah. want to be. James yeah. Harden, he's due for a game. He'll have a game. Oh, but no Kawhi question. Leonard. <laughs> will finish the series. Yeah. I have no doubt what that man will do under pressure. His reputation is stamped with me. Mm -hmm. But he's got to be healthy. So yeah. that 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 to me cool. he is the he's the game changer. Scott, you um have the two Eastern Conference teams in your list of the Celtics and the Bucks. Why do you have the the Bucks ahead of the Knicks for getting to the conference finals given what we've seen from both teams lately? Well, again, yeah, you know, to BJ's point they still have the best player on the court, the Bucks in Giannis Antetokounmpo. Mm -hmm. And I've seen him take his team all the way to the mountaintop and that being the championship. So that's why I give them the slight edge. Would I be surprised if the Knicks made it to the conference finals? No. I think that's got to be the expectation on them right yes. now. Yes. Now they got, now. Yeah. But that's why I'm applying the pressure. They got to own it. 
<laughs> yeah, that's the expectation. That's got to be the expectation. But in terms of just ranking them today, uh, again, I've got to still favor Giannis, you know, as the top player in that series. So if it comes down to who's going to close it out, I'm going to give him the slight advantage, you know. And again, and he has a good supporting cast. Do I think the Knicks are deeper as a team? Yes, I do. Um, but, uh, and, and and will I be surprised if they get there? No, but they got to go do it. And so, um, I, 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 I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I like to do. You know, when, when it gets to April and we're getting ready to go into the playoffs and assuming that both teams are fully healthy, and then I can really give an assessment then on, okay, going into it, you know, maybe the list stays the same, maybe it changes based on performance then because now the playoffs will be upon us. It's right there, and you'll you know see how the coaches are starting to handle their rotations because it'll be interesting with the Knicks. Right now, there are a lot of guys that are out. So the two new guys that come in are going to play – a lot of minutes. They have mm -hmm. to because they're down some, you know, OG's out multiple weeks. Mitchell Robinson's still going to be out multiple weeks. Julius Randle's still going to be out multiple weeks. So that's not going to be an issue. When the three of those guys come back, you know, what's the rotation going to look like then? How's the, the fit and the continuity going to be then? That will be, you know, questions that they have to answer. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, BJ, I, I, real quick. The Milwaukee Bucks, you can see they are not the best athletes right now as far as an athletic team. They don't have the athletic guys or a young team that can get up and down. However, when we make the playoff schedule and when the game slows down and you have a Tuesday night tip off and then we got a Friday night tip off and they're going to be sitting in New York City for three or four days if they were to play in the playoffs, I think that favors the Bucks. Yeah, because if you look at the Brook Lopez, 35, okay. Patrick Beverly, 35, Damian Lillard, 33, yes, Jay Crowder, 33, Middleton, 32, yes. Pat Connaughton, 31, yes. Danassis, 31, Giannis, 29, Campaign, 29, Bobby Boyce, 28. And, and, I, and I think when the when the, the, the referees take the whistle away a little bit and they're going to let guys play a little bit more physical, I think it favors them. I also think that they have a team that has more – with Giannis, you have the most versatility – of any player, especially in the Eastern Conference, because you can play him as the five, you can play him as a four, you can play him as a three on both sides of the ball. And I don't know how many other teams can match up to him because you can find some area on the floor that he can exploit on both sides of the ball. So I think that gives them a huge advantage, like Scott mentioned, when you have a player like Giannis. He will be the best player on the floor, possibly throughout the playoffs, depending on who's playing well. You know, there are only a few players, in my opinion, that can right. reach that level, right? Mm -hmm. Joker being one, I think Kawhi being another. Mm -hmm. you know, you, but Joel Embiid hasn't done it, okay, to that level. Yeah. So... <laughs> Boy, Mo, I, I, Mo, Mo, Mo's eyes really changed when you brought Joel Embiid's name up. Boy. Yeah, yeah. We're talking you about playing basketball that, and you want to talk yeah, to me yeah, about Joel but, Embiid. But, but, Come, on, that's what I'm saying. Come on, man. Come on, man. But, but uh, just as far as as far yeah. as being able to play at that level, I mean, I, he hasn't done it yet. I said that. He hasn't right. done it yet. You know, right. he hasn't done it yet. So <laughs> I think it's important to recognize that Milwaukee still, even though they're not showing it right now, they're not playing well. They have a big obstacle and a lot of things to overcome. It's really hard to say with a player like Giannis because you have to defend him with a team. It's impossible to defend him one on one. It's no impossible about that. Yeah, no, you, you, and, and, and a play, and I'm saying that in a playoff series, just like Joker, mm -hmm. you can't defend him one on one. Yeah. Okay. Most and I teams, think that's going to be yeah. 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 Most teams that prepare to play the Bucks. All they talk about is we're gonna we gotta set up a wall. We you gotta, gotta wall show him? him wall. We gotta show him three, four bodies every time. Because if you don't, you're dead. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can still set up the wall 
and he's still going to exploit you because <laughs> <laughs> he, he he attacks the rim with such explosion and tenacity you know and he so, plays with the force, force. He, he plays, plays with the force, with the force. and and, mm -hmm. and he he literally forces the referee to make a call you can't not make a call because he initiates the contact mm -hmm. yes so yes. and that and depending on whether he gets a favorable whistle or not will determine Right, will determine the well, outcome of that series. The other thing, though, with the Bucs, as, as much as the playoff schedule can favor them, with the exception of AJ Green, Doc Rivers isn't playing any of the younger guys on the roster. So how much gas will these guys have left in the tank? And speaking of the older you, guys... You mean Jackson? You talking about Jackson? Um, Milwaukee? Yeah. The young kid from UConn. Yeah, yeah. Like, he's not playing yeah. Marjon, uh, Marjon... Beecham, uh, he's whatever, he's yeah, yeah. like he's much, he's yeah. not playing a lot of these young guys. Despite when right. he got the job, him saying, you know, mm -hmm. these guys are gonna have to help us, um, you know. So it's like, okay, you're putting these minutes on these older players now, making this run through the rest of the regular season. Where, bear in mind, the Cleveland Cavaliers have now leapfrogged you in the standings. The Knicks have now added to their depth. You know, the Heat at some point will figure things out. So it's like, you could end up in a situation where you don't even have home court for the playoffs. That would be damaging if that happened. I, I still think some way they will figure that out. That I, I don't see Milwaukee falling out of the top four. Uh, I don't, again. And, and, well, and, and they, we just go, and, like you said, Scott, let's play basketball. There's only one way basketball. to find out. Exactly. Right? And again, but, um, exactly. We're gonna, we got to play basketball to find out. And I know they have not looked good. I know they had a big win last night, but it was against... It was against the Charlotte Hornets. Hornets. It was against yeah. Charlotte Hornets. Yeah. Yeah. But, so... We've got the All-Star break coming up, um, but before the All-Star break gets here, which are the teams you guys are going to be watching this week very closely? Who are you going to be focused in on? Well, we debated a little bit about the Dallas Mavericks. I want to watch the Dallas Mavericks starting right now. Show me something, P.J. Let's see, Washington. Let's see, yeah, yes, let's see if, if, if P.J. Washington, Daniel Gafford, uh, right out of the gate, make the impact that uh, I'm sure that Dallas wants them to and um, thinks they can, and that's why they made the trade. So they, they're at home, I think, for the first four games with these guys. So let's see what difference they make, and, and, and I'll be watching the Mavericks real closely. BJ, how about you? Who are you focusing on? Woo! Um, I, I felt like we, 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 we mentioned it. Um, I'm just going to stay out here and on the West Coast and really watch our LA Lakers. Our? Yeah. I'm Don't make me right. sick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna Don't make me right. throw up right I'm gonna here. Watch our, I'm going to watch Don't our watch. Don't make me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, most uh, secretly, uh, always, uh, he, he always has something uh, to say about the Lakers. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a love fest with Mo and the uh, LA Lakers. Brother. <laughs> so you know, the Lakers weren't able to pull off any trades. There were, they go Spence I've never seen, say. well, I've never seen a team get more coverage for doing nothing in the trade deadline, you know. <laughs> hey, man, welcome to the bronze ESPN. A, 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 a player in New York, he takes a towel and dries himself off, and they go, what is, what subliminal message is he having with the New York Knicks <laughs> towel? And, 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 and Mo eggs me, eggs it on and sends it to me, you know what I mean? I love it. So, I love so, it. So, yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to, ladies and gentlemen, Laker Nation, I'm going to start watching now a little bit and watch what the Lakers are going to do because now the rosters are set and they did pick up Spencer Dinwiddie, right? You know, it's major mm -hmm. news now. That, that's that, that's major news out here and see what they're going to do. So the Lakers are the team okay. I'm going to watch. Well, the team I'm watching um, have been 2-8 and eight in their last 10. They've lost four straight and they've got two games which they really need to win against the Hawks and the Wizards because after that, their schedule gets a little tricky facing the Cavs, Heat, Knicks, Cavs, Bucks, then Celtics. And that's the Philadelphia 76ers because right now they've gone from second to fifth in the Eastern Conference and they can continue that slide if they don't pick up wins. And with Joel Embiid maybe coming back before the end of the season, it's imperative that they stay in the playoff spots if he is to make a return. Um, this trade for Buddy Hield was to help play alongside Joel Embiid. I don't think they traded 
for Buddy Hill to kind of fill the gap that Embiid's leaving. So I'm, I want to see if they can try to stay afloat. And I'm also watching Tyrese Maxey because him now being the number one option is great reps for when he goes back to being a number two option alongside Joel Embiid. It just adds to his skill set. So that's who I'm looking at. But you guys at home, let us know in the Discord chat who you're watching this week. You can join by hitting the link in the description to the show. And um, we'll see you in there. We'll talk basketball in there. And I'm sure we'll have a lot more in store. We've got All-Star Weekend coming up. You guys excited for All-Star Weekend? Hmm. <laughs> 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 no, it's the fourth in Vegas, and we got All Star Weekend in <laughs> Indianapolis. Yeah, I'm gonna say it for the exactly. both of us. Yes, well, we're really excited. We're thrilled. Yeah, exactly. All Star <laughs> yeah, we're thrilled. I mean, nah. a great event. It's a great event. <laughs> <laughs> and well, you know what? I'm, I'm interested to watch. They're going back to the original format of East versus, East versus West. West. So let's see if we can get a more competitive game. Because quite frankly. The last couple of years uh, have not been a good product, a good representation of NBA basketball, all-star basketball. Uh, it really hasn't. So hopefully we'll see a restoration of that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I'm hopefully we see some good dunks this year as well. But that's uh, another conversation for another day. Appreciate both of you. <laughs> Hope you enjoy the Super Bowl. Um, sorry that your teams aren't in it, but uh, we go again next year. And until yes. next time, we'll focus on the basketball and get buckets. <laughs>